Well, we are here in our last week of true worship. And like I said, we're talking about the Holy Spirit, God's presence now and in eternity. I was thinking about this idea, and I think it's interesting. Bob even talks about this a little bit, how there are some people who seem to ignore the Holy Spirit entirely and just pretend like he doesn't exist. There's other people who it seems like they have this constant awareness and they're constantly getting impressions and for some of the rest of us, it's hard to know how to fit in between those two polar opposites. I remember as a kid, I grew up in a Presbyterian church. We didn't talk about the Holy Spirit. But as a kid, I remember being in church one Sunday. We didn't have air conditioning, so the doors were open, the windows were open, we had fans on the ceiling, and everybody was hot. We had a new family visiting. And in a church of 100, you know when there's a new family visiting, right? <laughs> you know when there's, everybody's like, there's somebody. So there was a new family visiting with somebody else. They were sitting toward the front. And all I remember is that the woman who was with them, the mom, she was wearing one of those wrap dresses. It was blue with white trim. And in the course of the sermon, I think we were about 20 to 30 minutes in. The sermon normally went 45 minutes. We were about halfway through. And suddenly she screamed at the top of her voice, jumped up out of her seat and started doing this. And then she started beating her body like this and dancing around, Aww. like all over the place. And for a minute we were like, is this the Holy Spirit? <laughs> like we had no idea what was going on. I mean, it was the most interesting thing that had happened ever on Sunday morning in church. Everybody was suddenly very fascinated with what was going on with that woman. And I have no idea what the sermon was about that day. But she yells, continues to dance, jumps into the aisle, and runs out the back of the church. It turns out that a bee had gotten in her dress and was stinging her. <laughs> it wasn't the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but we, well, we had never seen anything like that before. We thought, oh no, the charismatics have come to get us. There are two polar opposites when it comes, a lot of times, when it comes to people who talk about the Holy Spirit. Um, but we're going to deal with that a little bit today. Just a review, though, as we look back at what we've been learning. We started here. The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. And we've talked about this every single week, but this is our goal, to be those kinds of worshipers that the Father is seeking. And as we talked about, in spirit and in truth is specifically Jesus, the spirit and the truth of who Jesus is. And then we talked about how we always receive, that worship is not... First, something that we do, that we try to conjure up. Worship is first a gift, the gift of Jesus. And so we're called to receive, to come by His grace, and then nothing can stand in our way of worshiping Him. And then we talked about how this sentence here, the redeemed respond to God's revelation in ways that reflect His glory. That was sort of this idea of worship. And we unpacked this reflecting His glory part with these two E words, exaltation, edification, exaltation. We said we could do that with our hearts. We could do that with our actions. And we could also do it when we gather. And that was the edification part. We edify each other when we come together. And that's one of the main ways that we can worship each other using the gifts that God's given us. And we connected that with what Pastor Denny has been teaching about prepare, right? The P word prepare. So then we, last week we talked about how true worshipers sing and keep singing. I love the quote that he shared. The question is not, do you have a voice? The question is, do you have a song? If you have experienced Jesus, He has saved you from your sins. If you are promised eternity, you have a song to sing. It's the song of the redeemed. And so we talked about singing pros and cons and how we're called to keep singing. So today we're going to talk about how we experience God's presence now and in eternity. And one of the ways that we do that primarily, I think, is through the Holy Spirit. That's where it starts to get controversial. As Bob's very clear to point out, and as we teach here, God speaks first and foremost through His Word. God speaks first and foremost through His Word, through the Scriptures, and through prayer. Those are the primary spiritual disciplines, but we don't come to worship a book. We come to worship a God who's bigger than a book, who will not be bound, and whose presence through the Holy Spirit we can experience now and in eternity. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit. Our worship isn't only about God. It involves God. 
we theme our services here at Emmanuel Community Church. Pastor Denny says, this is where we're going, and we try to coordinate other things around that. But I say all the time, we don't come to worship a theme. It's not just about God. It involves God, specifically the person of Jesus. It is on, isn't only to and for God. It's not just our expression. It's not just us expressing our love and devotion to God, although that's part of worship, of course. But it's the way that we encounter and engage with God. I think what Bob's trying to say is it comes down to a personal relationship with, God, with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And are you aware of that? I know that so many times I'm not. I'm not. So, to kick things off, let's talk. What personal involvement do you expect from God when you gather with the church to worship Him? Or since we're talking about worship in all of life, what about in your daily life? I think part of it, like you just said, we know He's here, but to feel His presence. Mm. When we come together, sometimes that uh, seems easier to feel His presence mm. as we're all worshiping together. Yeah. I yeah. really love this book. Oh, good. I'm going to have to get some of these to give give out because God, so I'm keeping this one. <laughs> <laughs> and I just really have not thought of my involvement with God in any other way before this book, mm. like this. In such a you know daily life kind of thing, I yeah. only really thought about worship as when I'm with the church. Sure. You know, and and um, and when I try and be quiet and, and think, I, I try and imagine what if I was in the Old Testament? We were all at the temple and we were all in a festival. We were all our hearts all felt the same way, all together. We're having food and we're having good time, and that's what I try and do when I'm at church. And um, I know that sounds goofy, but you know, I'm just. What if it's all fun and goofy? Yeah. And then what if you're like that every day? And then, <laughs> nice. you know, and then I try and think, that'd be kind of cool. Yeah. That'd yeah. be kind of fun. Like when Pastor Danny taught about Psalm t um, 23, when, if we're all sheep, yeah. jumping around, you know, because we don't have a job to do, and we just, you know, he brings us to the food and the water and does the protection and does the teaching, and we just jump around <laughs> and enjoy, you know, where we are. Yeah. And I thought that would be, Come that must buddies. be, you know, by the time we got to the last chapter, I'm like, okay, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was just going to say. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, yeah we're going to get there. The end of my question. We're going to get there. We're going to get there tonight. But yeah, exactly. So now it's like, now I have that idea for the rest of my life in this side of heaven. Yeah. Like you said. And that's really a, a big answer, mm. I think. Good. For, for worship. So. Yeah. I'm very. Which good. connects with the whole daily life yeah, part. Yeah. I'm, I'm just very grateful for you know this book and this this class and you you guys should really teach it a lot oh good well really, thank you really learned a lot i'll pass that on i have too it's been yeah. a really good class for me yeah to learn so this is the question um specifically we're going to talk a little bit about the holy spirit now because one of the ways i think that we do experience God when you gather as a church to worship Him, whether we're singing or not, um, in our daily lives, it's through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not going to get all goofy on you, I promise, but I'm, but I'm serious about this. I'm serious. Like, there are a couple different ways that Bob outlines that I think were just so good, the way that the Spirit helps us experience God's presence in concrete ways, confirms that we are children of God. When you come to faith, and you know, I am His and He is mine. That's the Holy Spirit. If there's times now where you wonder, God, where are you? Am I your child? And you hear the answer, yes, through the Word. That's the Spirit confirming that. Yes, you are a child of God now and forever, beloved. That's the Holy Spirit confirming that in you. Comforts us in our trials doesn't happen all the time. I've been through a couple trials, and there's times that I've been very, very lonely. But there's other times where, whether it's a hug, whether it's just this time in the Word where I just hit the perfect Scripture, or just a sense of His presence, that's the Holy Spirit comforting you. Have you ever been confused? Yeah. If you say no, you're probably lying. Because <laughs> all of us are confused. Faith is a struggle with doubt. Doubt is not the enemy, but 
it's this sense of I'm confused and I'm searching for answers and we go through these cycles. That's normal. But when you are suddenly enlightened, you go, oh, I get it. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. It happens to me so much of the time. I tell this to our teams. Don't miss the sermon. Because God speaks to me through his Holy Spirit so many times through the sermon. And it might not even be what Pastor Denny's talking about that morning. So it might be something entirely different. But a thought just comes to my head for the first time. That's the Holy Spirit. It empowers us for serving others. Pastor Denny talked about this a little bit ago. Have you ever seen Dan Friend play? It's amazing. Have you ever seen Tim Giannis play? It's amazing. I just embarrassed him. <laughs> These guys are gifted and talented, but they've put a lot of hours and time into what they do. But this is still true. The Spirit empowers them to serve. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. You know what they get out of it? A lot of practice time. Early mornings. A lot of early mornings. Yeah. <laughs> right? Every once in a while, I'll thank you, but not every week. They do it because the Spirit empowers them. The Spirit applies the gospel to our lives. What we're doing right now. Like, how do we live this gospel out? It's not easy, let me tell you. You know that. But the Spirit helps us apply the gospel to our lives. Like, you start to see these things and you go, oh, that's the Spirit at work. Now, is there going to be an emotional response? Yeah, there's going to be emotions involved with it, but it's not, it doesn't have to be just an emotional response. The Spirit is at work in our lives, and so many times we miss it. And that's what I'm going to keep coming back to over and over and over again. Because for myself, like that was these, the understanding I got from this chapter. I am oblivious. <laughs> not a new thought. My wife can tell you. Um, but we need to be aware. And again, I also want to come back to, none, I'm also not saying that God doesn't speak through his word. God always speaks primarily through his word. But if we forget about this, we're missing out on the full presence of God. So, another easy question, because I like easy questions. How aware are you of the indications that God's Spirit is present with us? So that's what the Spirit does. What can we do? That's a question that I start to ask myself. What can we do? What can we do to try to be less oblivious like Sam? Bob says a couple different things. First of all, acknowledge God's omnipresence. Big word. It simply means he's everywhere. He is always present. Always has been, always is, and always will be present. There is no place that you can go to hide from his presence. Psalms is very clear about that. Go to the highest heaven. He's there. Go to the depths. He's there. Where can you hide? Rhetorical question, nowhere. <laughs> nowhere can you hide. God makes his presence known anywhere and at any time because he's already there. Try to wrap your head around that. To be all places at all times. Just us in the room. We didn't even have 25 people here. All of us were spending time praying and God was hearing all of us and responding in a personal way, all at the same time. Because he was present here, but he was also present when the students were upstairs singing. Do you hear him? He was there. Like you start to try to wrap your head around this. And yeah, he's already there. I remember as a kid in church being taught that, and you really, or at least becoming aware of that for the first time, and thinking of like the old operator dispatch. <laughs> and you know, trying to wrap your mind. Everyone is lost. I mean, how does that? You know, it's, yeah. it's probably really bad theology to think of it as a, you know, as an operator. You know, like, well, but you're trying to just. John again, but. Yeah, you're trying to understand it though, like uh, your finite brain, like yeah. Isn't that movie with Jim Carrey that he he, he becomes God for or he Bruce Almighty? Bruce Almighty, Almighty. Yeah. and he's typing all his emails. And he's like, and that that right there is like wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Bruce Almighty, that was good. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Also, expect God's promised presence. I love this. Expect it's promised. So you don't have to wonder, like, is it going to be there? Is he going to show up? Yes, 
He's already promised it. God was present from the beginning. We've just become more aware of it, which is what we're talking about. It's partially just an awareness, paying attention to God at work. And expect promise presence. We'll talk about this expectation in just a little bit. Here's the thing. As I mentioned earlier, we have some really bad, I think, presence theology. Um, I see that in some of the songs that we sing. I see that in some of the comments that get made in between services. Um, and some of it freaks me out just a little bit because, as we'll talk about, it gets laid on my shoulders, which is way above my pay grade. But first of all, we think that it's our worship that brings God's presence near, as if there's this spiritual equation, A plus B equals God's presence. You don't control the presence of God. I don't control the presence of God. The presence of God is like a wind. It goes where it will. We do not control that. And if at any point in time we think, oh, when we sing this song, when we raise our hands, oh, when we speak in tongues, oh, when we do this, no. This is not a cause and effect type of situation. It's never our worship that brings God's presence near. Maybe we become more aware of His presence, but He was always there. And we don't control the Spirit of God. This essentially, I think of this in some ways as just another variation of salvation by works. If you do this, you'll be saved. If you do this, God shows up. And you can find that in any other religion. You do, you do enough of this, and God will be pleased. Christianity is not like that. That's not what the Scripture teaches. We do not control His presence. We think we can come near to God without Christ. We see this a lot, especially if you look at some of the research that's been done with, with students, the next generation, this concept of I'm okay, you're okay, and sort of it's a God thing. It's very mystical. We think we can come near to God without Christ, but that's not salvation. And we talked about before how we need to be specific about this. That's not just we just get to come to Jesus or get, or get to come to God without Jesus. But we only come near to God through the work of Jesus. Worship is a gift. Salvation is a gift. Spirit of God, gift. We think worship leader or pastor can bring us into the presence of God. This is the one that really freaks me out. Someone will come up and they'll say, oh, you ushered us into the presence of God this morning. And I want to say, no, I did not. That is way above my pay grade. I do not want that on my shoulders, positive or negative. Because it's not our worship. It's nothing that I've done that brings the presence of God. And if you feel like he hasn't showed up, then suddenly it's my fault? No. no, 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 no. And here's the interesting thing. We talk, say all the time, we don't believe in this clergy laity split, but then we'll make comments like that, which seems to reinforce that idea. That somehow there's these special spiritual people who can usher in God's presence and there's all the rest of us. who We can only experience God's presence if, if the special people are there. Not true, not true, not true. So there's no worship leader or pastor who can bring us into the presence of God. And then we think music is the answer to bring God's presence near. When Tim really cranks on that guitar, that's what does it. Right? It's just another variation of this. Can it stir our emotions? Yes. Can it, help it, can it help alter our emotional, our psychological, our mental state? Yeah, it can. We see that even in Scripture. Saul has an evil spirit. He's got darkness. David plays, and suddenly it's lifted, right? So we know there's a therapeutic effect for music. That's a God-given gift, but let's not confuse that with the Spirit of God. Um, there's a, a song by a guy named Derek Webb, and he sings this song, and it's very tongue-in-cheek, but it's painful. He goes through the Spirit, the Father, and the Son, and the first line is, I don't want the Spirit, I just want to kick drum. I don't want the Spirit, I just want to kick drum. And you're like, what? what? <laughs> and he basically calls it like it is. And he says, I don't want the Father, I just want a gumball machine. I don't want the Father, just want a gumball machine. And then he says, I don't want the Son, just want a jury of my peers. So in other words, we don't want God. We want someone who's going to do what we say, who's going to give us what we want, and who's going to give us a nice emotional, mm, musical fix. But music's not the answer. 
Only Jesus can lead us into God's presence, and he accomplished that through his substitutionary death, which forever removed the curtain of God's judgment that separates us from his presence. It's Jesus. That's where we started, right? Receive. It's a gift. Pardon? There's the veil. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) The torn veil. That's the veil. That's right. Yeah. So what else can we do? We can do these things, right? We can pursue God's experienced presence. Now, this for me is sort of the new thing because, again, I, did I mention I grew up Presbyterian? We don't talk about the Holy Spirit. But this concept of God's experienced presence, this was great for me because we talked a lot about God's sovereignty, about how God still wants other people to be saved through the work of Jesus, how at the end of time every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He will be King of kings and Lord of lords. God's will will be accomplished. He is sovereign. But to connect that with the concept of presence was wonderful for me. I don't know who he's calling to salvation. I don't know how he's going to work out his perfect will. But I know that for his glory, he wants me to experience more of him. And he wants you to experience more and more of him and others that don't even know him yet. And so to to pray for and pursue God's experienced presence here and now is good. Does it replace Scripture? No. But we are called to pursue God's experienced presence. As we look through the Bible, we see a number of different examples of that. Um, Moses, burning bush, Mount Sinai. Um, We see that in the tabernacle. God's presence falls in a unique way. We see this um, in Peter's shadow in the New Testament. He just would walk and his shadow would fall on someone who's crippled, healed instantly. We see this in what we read in Revelation when it comes to heaven. His experienced presence. He's everywhere, but when we become more aware of him, we experience him in a new and deeper way. That for me was sort of an aha. If true worshipers encounter God through the Spirit, Is there anything that we can do to help or hinder that encounter? We just talked about a couple things, but as we talk ourselves, think about our own lives. Is there anything we can do to help or hinder that encounter? I can think of lots of hinder, for sure. (laughs) (laughs) Tone deaf. (laughs) Just... um, (laughs) Uh, when I've had a week where I haven't got my quiet times in on a regular basis, you feel that disconnect with the Spirit and when I'm not, when not spending time in God's Word, uh, learning what He has to say and letting the Spirit speak through that, that's a big hindrance for me. Right. I love that. I think that's so true. If we're not spending time in the Word, how do we expect to hear from the Holy Spirit? They confirm each other. Where we just quieted ourselves and did and tried to sort of empty our all the busy thoughts and then ask God to, you know, you know, help me encounter Your Spirit right now because we're just racing around, thinking all day long and. Maybe some set times where we just do that periodically through the day. Just, okay, God, I'm going to slow down for a minute. And, you know, if you have something to say, hmm. specifically do that through your spirit. I don't do that enough. But, uh, That's I, good. I enjoyed what we did at the beginning here. Just allow him to speak a little bit. That's good. Hey, taking time to be quiet, you know. So there's three attitudes that he highlights. And I loved these. They were so good. So I put them in first person so that we could sort of claim them, hopefully, but also ask ourselves, is this true of me? Because for the most part, it's not, but I want it to be. I want it to be. First one he said is, I am desperately dependent. When... I started here, that wasn't that long ago, and I think one of the ways we do this is through prayer. 
But when I started, someone said, I think we need to do more prayer here at Emmanuel. I said, that's great. I would love to be a part of that. They said, I went to this church. Maybe you've heard of it. It's in New York. It's called Brooklyn Tabernacle. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, somewhat famous church. I've heard of it. Been there once. And they said, yeah, um, yeah I just went for a prayer service. And they just prayed and prayed and prayed. I said, yeah, I said, that's, that's true. So I went and I got the book. Maybe you've read it, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. And the thing that struck me as I read that book was how desperately dependent they were on God in their relationships, in their ministry, over and over again, they were so aware of their inadequacy. And they constantly said, God, help us because we are desperate. And he would show up over and over and over again. But they were desperate. And if you've been to their meetings, like these are some desperate, desperate people. So for me, I have to confess that I... I'm not desperately dependent. I'm pretty white, middle class, American, and that makes me self-sufficient. I think I'm doing pretty well holding things together. And let me tell you, this takes a little bit of work because I got it all together, at least on the outside. But because of that, I am not experiencing the full presence of God because I'm living in my own strength. So I think a question for us is, am I desperately dependent? Does your stuff mean that you can't be desperately dependent? No, but it makes it harder. It makes it harder. So for me, the first two things, prayer and confession. Also, he says, I am eagerly expectant. God works throughout our gifts. I meant to put our in there. God works throughout our gifts. He gave a couple of examples, and I love these. When you walk into church, do you think, oh, look, the guy behind the tech booth. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, he's exercising his gift of helps. Like that's the Holy Spirit at work. And he's using his giftings. For someone who's teaching, they're using leadership, teaching gifts. And the Holy Spirit is working and empowering them and working through them. When we give our tithes and offerings, that's a gift of giving. That's the Holy Spirit at work. And then the ways those get used through missions to help the ministries of our church. When we prayed earlier, God's mercy that we were experiencing together, we've, I've really enjoyed that. We've been trying to do this more often at the end of our services where we'll have a prayer slide up and so if you wanted someone to pray with you, we'd love to walk through life with you. And what I found is so many people come up and they'll just start talking. They won't come up and they'll say, I need prayer. They'll just say, hey, how are you doing? I'm pretty good. This happened this week. And well, if you let them talk, suddenly they get to the point. There's a story in there somewhere, but they still might not say, will you pray for me? Mm. All I have to say is, you know what? Can I pray for you right now? Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> I guess what they've been trying to get to the whole time, but it just took them all to get there. But God works throughout our gifts, and it's amazing to see the healing even that happens in people's lives through that. What if God was present to do great things in our hearts in every one of these moments? If we don't expect him to be active, we'll most likely miss what he's doing. We can expect great things from a great God who is dwelling in us and among us. That's my favorite part. We can expect great things from a great God who is dwelling in us and among us. Yeah, love it. And then he says, I am humbly responsive. And that, for me, begs the question, like, why aren't we more humble? I know it's one of those weird things. As soon as you say, I'm humble, you're proud, and that messes everything up. But, but why? Why do, we, why do I struggle with this, being humbly responsive? I think, I mean, the first thing is a subjective opinions. Like he even mentions, like, don't ever go to someone and say, God told me to tell you this. Because maybe he did, maybe he didn't. It could really could easily be a subjective opinion. Sam, yes. That's something that happened to me. Someone said to me, God told me to tell you this. I said, thank you. When God tells me, I'll accept it. <laughs> when he tells me too, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's, that's wisdom because I think he will. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He absolutely. will. He He'll confirm that, yeah. When someone, and I, you know, they want to be big. Yeah. I'm not going to be a part of their ego. Yeah, which is a huge part of it, right? If we call a spade a spade, that's ultimately what's happening. Yeah. 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 That's good. Yeah. That's good. 
Yeah, that's happened to me too. Yeah. Where someone's come up and shared a word and yeah. Yeah, right. I didn't sense that God was saying that to me, which no. was a really disconnect. And I have had times. And I, it was, yeah, you know, and it was, it's for sure. Just like the Holy Spirit before. You'll know it. Yeah. On the up, I had a neighbor in Wisconsin. She was unbelievably responsive, responsive to God. And she would show up at somebody's house and say, I have dinner for you. And invariably it was because something happened and they weren't able to. She just, God would lead her to, to take dinner to somebody or whatever. And in every case, they needed it. Yeah, which I love. And that, that brings us to the second one. For me, like, why don't I do those kinds of things? Because I don't want to be wrong. Oh, if there's one thing I hate, being wrong. I want to be right. Like, that's my personality. I just want to get it right. I want to be right. I don't want to look bad. I want to be right. Um, so instead of showing up and saying, God told me to tell you, what if you just showed up with a meal? That's right. Can I pray for you? Yeah. Like, I feel like the Holy Spirit is telling me to do this, but maybe not. But it's always okay if I say, may I pray for you? Very few people will say no, unbeliever or believer. If you ask someone, can you pray with them? 99.9% .9 of the people you meet here in Indiana will say yes. But I don't want to be wrong. But again, I think I, I'm not humble. I'm, I'm prideful in that. And then spiritual experiences. We've talked about this a little bit, but I think we search for spiritual experiences instead of biblical ones, to be honest. We want those spiritual experiences. But that's not the goal ever. The way that we experience God is first of all through Jesus, through the Bible, through prayer. Spiritual experiences can be a good thing too, but that's not the primary way that we experience Him. Would you say, would you say that just like the being American, you know, the, the idea of being humble is a, is a weak position. It, it comes across that way as an American, you know, humble, that, that's weak. You know, we're all about, you know, mm -hmm. powerful. Yeah. And so that, that, that word just takes that. And so when we think of it, we think that automatically goes in our head, weak, you know. So we tend not to go there. Mm -hmm. And that surprises me. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we're supposed to be cowboys. Yeah. Well, that goes along with, with submitting to wives submitting to husbands, and they mm -hmm. automatically think of yeah. you know, where yeah. that's not the case at all. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we don't want to submit to anybody, each other, or yeah. yeah, be humble. I think so, definitely, that's part of it. Yeah. Yeah, and I just, we basically talked about this already, but that's not the goal. It's not the heart of our relationship with God these experiences. It definitely adds. So, another question. Desperate dependence, eager expectation, humble responsiveness. How has God begun to build these attitudes into your own inner life? When I was reading this week and I came across that sentence about being desperately dependent, it like jumped out at me and slapped me in the face. I was like, wow, because I, I think, I don't know, I've just been dealing with self-reliancy, self-sufficiency, don't need God, I've, I've got this life. And so when I read that, I just had to like sit on it for a minute and just let it really sink in. But it was like, God threw those words up in my face and just needed to remind me that, you know, that's, I, have, I have four kids at home. So it's it's just, it's busy, it's go, 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 go. And, and like you and I'm sure so many others, my mind wanders and wanders and it's here and it's there and it's all over the place. And it's just, it's busy, 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 life is. And so it's like I, I just need to set aside that extra time, I feel like God's telling me during the day. Um, just to spend with him, be more dependent on him, less dependent on me, less dependent on my kids and everything in my life. So for me, that's that just spoke to me this week. So it's one thing that I just, I have to work on. Yeah. But, yeah. I think we all do. Yeah. Barb. I was thinking of a desperate dependence too, but in a different vein than, than she's going at it. Um, it isn't what I need from, from my life. It's that I know who I am without him, 
and it makes me very dependent on him to not be depressed. Mm -hmm. Yvonne and I That's have experienced good. a very, very desperate dependence on God for our children because they're they're older now and they, they're outside of the house and we can't just go protect them anymore. You know, they have to, and so we have to trust them. Or tell them what to do, what them which used to work. Yeah. <laughs> so we have to watch it unveil and we have to trust in, we have to put it all in God's hands. You know, we have to trust that he gave us the right things to bring them up, but that when we let them go, got it. And that, that's you have to wait. That's mm -hmm. sometimes tough. We, we sometimes sit there and we go we need to calm. We need to do that. I mean, and we have to both say to it, no, we gotta let it happen. You know, and just trust. And that's tough sometimes. It's really tough. That's hard. Yeah. Mine's a little different. It's the eager expectation. Because I'm nearing a major, major change in my life soon. And I have no idea what plan B is from God. I have none. And he won't answer me. <laughs> He's like, wait. I just, I hate that word. <laughs> you have no plan A, though, wouldn't have it, right? I have no plan A or plan B right now. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. And I, it's kind of like there's something out there, and I know there's going to be a major change, and I have the foggiest clue what it's going to be. But he's getting me. I love teaching. I really do. But I'm, I'm very much sensing the shift in what he's going to have me go do next. I mean, I, I'm seeing the end, and it's it's not a it's not a bad thing. It's not it's it just is, and it's just like I hate not knowing. Mm, <laughs> you and me both. So I mean, there's an eagerness, and there's also this yeah. Thing like, What's next? Yeah. 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 Those things are just really hard for me when everything's just going status quo and pretty good. And uh, obviously, when I'm desperate, that's when my desperate dependence kicks in and that eager expectation. And um, I don't look forward to those times, but a plus of them is it sort of resets me and recalibrates me to those things. Hmm. Um, I like the status quo and then it <laughs> makes me think I'm doing well you know I got it under control and all that and then all of a sudden the rug gets pulled out and then I go to those and I really wish I could do those even in the good times do that better and it's really hard to do it is yeah it's me too force to them and that's God bringing me back and I'm thankful that he does that yeah <clears throat> yeah so these are things that we're going to be focused on now, this side of glory. True worshipers hold fast to the hope that one day, one day, we will do nothing but worship the Lord. For we consider it the great end of our existence to find ourselves numbered among the worshipers of God. Let it be. We long for His unveiled presence. We look forward to that day. So, last chapter. How did this chapter deepen your understanding of heaven? Anybody? Yeah. So, let's talk about worship a little bit, right? In heaven, he talks a bit about how it's the same. Let's talk about how it's different. I thought the same was interesting, but the different part, this is one thing we look forward to, and he uses this sort of as a linchpin between these two chapters. So, these attitudes, we look forward to heaven, where we'll be in the actual unveiled presence of God. In this life, our experience of God's presence is limited by what God chooses to show us and what we can perceive. I know I keep going back to Moses a lot, but that's a great, experience, great example of this concept of unveiled presence. Because in Moses' case, he's on Mount Sinai. He, it's veiled presence. He says, I want to see your face. He says, you can't handle it. So God says, I'm going to hide you, I'll put my hand over you, and I will, you'll see my back and I'll declare my name. And that's the most you can handle, Moses, without being destroyed. Even then, his face glows, right? But we will see his unveiled presence and experience that. Um, yeah, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> We won't have to confess our sin, evangelize the lost, or seek justice for the oppressed. These things all happen... Post, fall, pre, glory. We won't have to do any of these things. 
evangelize lost, seek justice for the oppressed, there will be no poverty. All believers will be gathered around the throne. We won't have any desire to sin. Lewis talks about a little bit about this in his book, The Weight of Glory. He says, for those people who are moving closer and closer to God and becoming more like God, this concept of sin, it won't be attractive. They will want all of God and anything that keeps them from that. They want to get rid of that. The other is true. If someone is continually going the opposite direction from God, removing themselves from His presence, then being in heaven is not something that they're going to look forward to. They're not looking for the unveiled presence of God because they've been trying to avoid that their whole entire life. So we won't have to worry about any of that. Mm. We'll worship God with glorified bodies. Lewis also talks about, a little bit about this in his book, The Last Battle. And the phrase that keeps coming up as they enter this heaven is further up and further in. And they just keep running and running and running, never getting tired. Further up and further in, further up and further in. And for us, we'll be able to worship God with glorified bodies. And it won't just be singing. It won't just be naked babies with harps. It'll be those things that you love to do with all of the sin, all of the imperfection removed. I enjoy dabbling in woodcuts. I'm not very good at it. But in heaven, let me tell you, I'm going to make some amazing woodcut art. <laughs> we'll be able to sing, yes, it'll be amazing, but we'll be able to eat at the same time to the glory of God. Bags full. Bags full. <laughs> Never-ending bags. Eternal bags of chips and salsa. <laughs> we'll never reach the body of God. But, uh, Tom? Uh, Bob points out that we'll continue to learn, too. We'll continue to learn about God. We'll know more of Him, but we'll continue to be able to learn more about Him because it will be never-ending. Amazing, amazing, amazing. There will be no separation between adoration and action. And this is one of the things that we've been talking about through the whole class. What's the connection between the weekend experience and the rest of our lives? And the problem is we suffer from a disconnect. One of the challenges we face on earth is the disconnect between worship as an event and worship as an every moment. While we understand that worship is something we do in all of life, we're constantly tempted to view Sunday mornings as true worship. We end up seeking to recharge our spiritual batteries on Sunday, struggling the rest of the week to be aware of God's presence in the mundane affairs of life. That won't be a problem in heaven. It won't just be eating. What do you love to do? What are you passionate about? Do you love to build things? Eat? Garden. Sow? Garden? I hope this answers the question, will our pets be in heaven? Because the answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis would agree with you. We don't, I don't know for sure, but Lewis would agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. No separation between adoration and accent. Everything that we do will be worship. It'll be amazing. All those things that we want to do. I mean, walk on water. I'm hoping for that in heaven, man. I want to walk on water. And flight would be pretty sweet, too, while we're at it. If I can walk through a couple walls, yeah. Like all that stuff. Perfect, perfect, perfect in heaven. Our knowledge of God will no longer be by faith, but by sight. Right now, everything's by faith. We come by faith. And then we'll see. And let's be honest. Even with faith, it's not always easy because this world is messed up and broken, twisted, screwed up. And we're all aware of it. We bear the curse in our bodies. We have lost fathers, mothers, spouses, children. We will see them face to face. And we'll be worshiping together. The Greek Orthodox get this a little bit more than we do. When they talk about worship, their concept is that when we worship together, in a sense, we transcend time and space. So when they talk about the communion of the saints, they mean that when they worship God, all believers that have gone before are all there with them worshiping God together. And so while theologically I might not totally agree with the use of icons, that's partially why they use icons. It's not just a prayer method. For them, it's also a reminder that these saints who have gone before, they are here with us. He is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. 
And so we worship together. And it's not just us here in Fort Wayne, Indiana, but it's all believers who have gone on before. That's a great thought. If you've lost someone who's fallen asleep in the Lord, when we worship together on the weekend, they're doing the same thing. We're separated. We don't see them, but we're worshiping the same God together. Even now. This room is really crowded. This room is really crowded, yeah. right? Yeah. So there's a sense in which, yes, we are worshiping together. We will no longer be separated by anything. We'll see fully. Who cares? Right? Ultimately, all that stuff that we've been talking about over these last few weeks, who cares? There is a connection. We might not see it, but first of all, it opens our eyes to the cosmic battle for true worship. Life on earth is not meaningless. Our decisions reflect our worship. We are exalting either the only Savior of the world or something else. Remember before we talked about our favorite theologian, Bob Dylan? You've got to serve somebody. You've got to worship somebody. It might be the devil. It might be the Lord. It might be yourself or it might be the Lord, but you've got to choose. Choose you this day whom you will serve, whom you will worship. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the way of. This is a theme all the way through Scripture. Who will you worship? I started to go there last week, but I didn't because I wanted to save it. When we worship, we are waging war. We're declaring that this area, this body, this soul belongs to Jesus. And my worship through Jesus, to the best of my ability, is always going to be focused in that direction. So we wage war. It's a cosmic war. It's been happening since the beginning. Who will you worship? That's what Adam and Eve had to come face to face with in the garden. Who will you worship? But it's constantly happening, whether we're aware of it or not. It causes us to pursue holiness. He says if you, again, going back to Lewis, if you know the destination, hopefully that changes how you live right now. Are you taking steps toward God? Heaven's just the next step. If you're taking steps away from God, heaven's not where you're going to end up, and heaven's probably not where you want to end up because you're not trying to get there. But hopefully it would cause us to walk in that direction. And then it fills us with joy and confidence in the midst of suffering. For me, I didn't totally relate to this as much because, I, again, I am really... American and pretty safe, insulated, and comfortable in my life. I read about a lot of Christians who are facing terrible persecution. What's happening in Syria? What's happening with the spread of ISIS? Christians are being slaughtered. But I've never apologized for being a white male. I'm not apologizing. I'm just saying that's the reality of it. It makes my life pretty easy. Yeah, it makes my life pretty easy. What I can say, though, is that with the suffering, not persecution, but suffering, I have experienced this is still a temptation. The temptation will be to abandon our trust in God and turn to false gods for protection. Like it's a temptation. If you face suffering, pain, and persecution, this is a temptation. But in the midst of that, we look to heaven, we go, that's where we're going. And so now we can have joy. We can have confidence in that. Yeah. It helps us understand communion. And this is something that he sort of alludes to at the end of the chapter, but he doesn't necessarily go into quite. But for us, it helps us understand communion, which can be a little weird because if you think about it, we're celebrating something that happened 2,000 years ago with a bunch of Jews who were practicing Passover, which we sort of understand here to Emmanuel, but it's a little bit different. And so we're going to practice it with a little piece of flat square bread and a little cup of grape juice. Like, so what really is the connection? We talk about this a little bit, but as we feast at his table and proclaim the Lord's death, that reconciled us to God. And there, that's what we talk about a lot. And this is true, right? This is scriptural. Whenever you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death until he 
comes again. And that's the part that we don't talk about as much. But heaven helps us understand communion. Because now we do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Our eyes are on the future wedding feast. Communion is a picture of the feast that we will have in heaven. We're among those who have loved his appearing. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, because we recognize that our citizenship is in heaven. And so when we take communion, we're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. And when he comes, then we'll truly understand communion and we'll celebrate together. Yeah, it's another disconnect, but I think it's so good for us to see that as we talk about the worship of heaven. True worshipers hold fast to the hope that one day we will do nothing but worship the Lord, for we consider it the great end of our existence to find ourselves numbered among the worshipers of God. Let it be. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, you are holy and you are good. We come before you as your children tonight, and we thank you that you have called us to worship you. You've given this gift of Jesus. You've given this gift of the Holy Spirit. That you are speaking into our lives, guiding us in so many ways. I pray that you would help us to be much more aware. Aware of the way that you're moving, aware aware of the way that you're speaking, and aware of these choices that we have to worship you or to worship ourselves and to worship idols. I pray, God, that you would help us to be numbered among the worshipers, the true worshipers of God around the throne of heaven. I pray, God, that that would begin now. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thanks, guys. Thank you. Have a great night.